Okay, uh, we can all hear me, I think. Yeah. Um, who knows about uh, anti fragility? Uh, about 10, 20 people. Well, I, I'm going to tell you a lot more about it today uh, because you cannot only apply it to DevOps but also to your life. You can really apply anti fragility to your life. Um, first of all, I'm from a very small country. I'm from, uh, from Holland. I, I read that uh, in the Moscow urban area there live 70 million people. In Holland live nearly 70 million people. So actually, our country is smaller than Moscow. Okay. <laughs> uh, to explain what I do, um, I like to use the, uh, the nine square model. Uh, it's com uh, comprised of an operational, tactical, and strategical uh, level. And you have business on the left and IT on the right. And there is something in the middle, and that's called the information column. And that is the column that does makes the specifications and does the support of IT to the business. And I like to use this uh, gearbox inside it to show that all those squares have to work together to make a company work actually. All those squares. So strategic, operational, technical, business, information and technology. All the nine squares. Um, the right part is covered by ITIL. Who knows about ITIL? Oh, a lot of people. Okay. Uh, ITIL is the, the library that covers IT. Um, Bizzle, I think nobody knows Bizzle. Does anybody know Bizzle? No. no. Actually, that's the model uh, that I'm working on because I work for the ASL Bizzle uh, Foundation. That's a non-profit uh, foundation. And um, that Bizzle Foundation is actually uh, connecting the business with IT. And that's also important for DevOps because if you are talking about DevOps, uh, then uh, you actually you need a lot of things to see. You need to know about your business need, their value, their mission, the capability, uh, the data, the service, the technology, the governance, the strategy. So a lot of those things you need to know to make sure that DevOps can spread in the organization to come from DevOps to enterprise DevOps. And that's actually what I'm uh, doing uh, almost all day. Because if you start with DevOps in a company, you start there. Can you imagine? On the operational level, and it's only IT. The rest of the company does not care. And Bizzle can help you to move upward and to move more to the left. So, that's enough about me. Let's talk about uh, anti-fragility. This is uh, actually four covers for the same book. Um, and um, in the, the right cover you can also already see um, some monster that is called Hydra. And actually that monster is uh, for some part also behind anti-fragility. I will show you in one of the next uh, slides. So anti-fragility. <coughs> was written by uh, Nassim Nicholas Taylor, Taylor, and believe me, this man is brilliant. Uh, the books that he writes are that difficult that it, took you, it, it takes you about weeks or more to, to really understand what he means, but he is brilliant. Uh, he likes to work with this kind of um, graphs, a variable uh, that can uh, increase or decrease, and then you will have gain or pain. For instance, this simple one. It could be your salary, right? If it goes up, variable, you, it will, uh, you will be happier. And if, when it goes down, below a certain point, it will really be a pain because you have not enough money to, uh, to, uh, to, be, to, to live. Or the other way around, it could be like this. For instance, the number of defects that you receive, and the more defects you receive, uh, the unhappy you get. But this is not what anti-fragility is about. These are linear relationships. And anti-fragility is about non-linear, like this. He says that anything that has more upside than downside from random events or shocks is anti-fragile. The reverse is fragile. And the second thing that he says, to judge the fragility or the anti-fragility of a system is to ask whether it is accelerating towards harm or benefit. So accelerating towards gain or pain. And then you see something like this. 
You see, when the variable is increasing, it accelerates towards pain. Or this one, if the variable decreases, it uh, accelerates towards gain. Well, if you put that together, like this, this is actually, what do you think? Is this, should this be fragile or anti-fragile? This is fragile because it accelerates towards pain. And the right one is actually anti-fragile. It accelerates towards gain. But the only problem is, of course, you don't know where you are. We, there are two blue, blue dots, but you could be on the right side, you could be on the left side, you don't know. The uh, left graph is what you call concave, and the right one is what you call convex. So you could be here or you could be there. Uh, well, it's actually, it, uh, uh, I, I would expect that uh, the green text would appear later, but it doesn't matter. What you see here is the number of deployments per month. The number of deployments per month. If it, uh, suppose you start on the very left side of it and you don't deploy at all. Because you have a super stable system, it already exists for about 10, 20 years and you never have to change it. Well, you're happy. But as soon as you start to deploy, as soon as you need to deploy, you will get unhappier and unhappier and uh, in the middle you will, be, you will be in a real pain. But when you keep uh, increasing the number of deployments, you will be happier and happier. So the result is, continuous delivery is anti-fragile. That's the good news. So you are already working anti-fragile. Another one, and I can uh, already hear is, uh, uh, the answer is right there. Software projects are fragile because if you uh, uh, think about the number of tasks coordinated in a project, suppose you, suppose you do not coordinate anything on the left part. You do not co coordinate anything. Oh, it will be chaos. But as soon as you start to coordinate, well, you will get happier and happier until you make that project bigger and bigger and bigger and of course we all know big projects they fail most of the time so actually especially software projects are fragile you don't want them so you do want continuous delivery you don't want projects and to remember what is fragile or anti-fragile it's quite simple because the uh, anti-fragile is a smile and the fragile is a frown. <laughs> it's that simple to remember. And when you ask people what are the opposites of fragile, people always say, well, I think that's robust or it may be resilient, but they almost never say anti-fragile anti because they don't know the word. <laughs> and actually, Tyler, the writer of the book, was the first one who introduced the term because anti-fragile is the real opposite of fragile. Now let me give you some uh, real life e examples uh, after this graph. You can see here actually what's the difference between those, uh, those terms. A fragile system actually breaks from the very beginning because it's fragile. A robust system, it will keep stable a long time, but in the end it will break. And, uh, a resilient system, um, it will break a little, but after that, it will recover and become at the same level that it was. But it will not get better than that. And the only thing that gets better from shocks, from time, is actually anti-fragile. So this is actually the difference between the uh, four terms. Some uh, real life examples, this is fragile. Every shock is too much. This is also extremely fragile. And actually, agile... <laughs> and why is agile fra uh, why is it fragile? Because you do not put software to the test. Uh, you, you make a, a potentially shippable increment and then it stays on the shelf. You have to switch to continuous delivery to put that software to the test. So Agile alone is a good idea, but it's not enough. 
This could be something you could call robust. It will be stable in uh, a long time, uh, but eventually, if, you, uh, if the shocks are hard enough, big enough, it will break. This is something that you could uh, call robust. Unix. And this is something you would call resilient. And this is from the Greek mythology. Uh, it's the phoenix. And maybe you know the phoenix. Uh, it's a mythical a bird. And it um, actually rises from the ashes of its predecessor. But it never will get, get better than the predecessor. It is resilient. It will recover, but ne not get better. And this is also something you could call resilient. Uh, this is an Airbus uh, 280, uh, and what you uh, what you have here, you have a backup system of a backup system of a backup system, and if the, the vacuum system doesn't work, the electrical system will, uh, will work, and if the electrical system doesn't work, you have a rhythm hydraulic system that will work. Um, so this is aircraft in general are pretty resilient, and this is actually anti-fragile. This is what I talked earlier, uh, was, uh, the, the monster that was on the cover of one of, uh, of, the, of the books. Uh, this is Hydra. And Hydra is also a mythical uh, creature. Um, if you cut off a head of the Hydra, immediately two heads grow back. So if you attack it, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So, actually, yeah, Hydra... It, uh, Nothing can be more anti-fragile than Hydra. And Chaos Monkey is also anti-fragile. <laughs> who, who already works with something like the Chaos Monkey in his daily work? Only, I only see one hand. Okay. okay. Because what the Chaos Monkey does, uh, invented by, uh, by Netflix, is actually uh, killing virtual machine, machines uh, at random during office hours and see how the, uh, how the system reacts. Uh, and if it does not react on killing such a virtual machine, uh, the engineers have to, uh, they have to work on that during office hours. Uh, and their incentive is that they will not be caught, they will not be paged uh, in the middle of the night. So the random attacks from the Chaos Monkey are only during office hours from 9 o'clock in the morning till 3 p.m. Um, and there's also, uh, there are other monkeys were introduced, for instance, a latency monkey, which uh, introduces uh, artificial latency in the system and checks how the system reacts. If it does not react good, also the engineers will repair it. So the system is learning, the engineers are learning, and the system is getting better and better and better. And of course, this is, uh, in the meantime, this has become uh, open source, so you could, if you would like, you could use uh, the Chaos Monkey uh, software in your own company. And actually, um, um, it became, uh, in the meantime, a complete simian army, a simian army, a monkey army of all those monkeys. Uh, so not only the Chaos Monkey, also the Latency Monkey, the Janitor Monkey, the Confirmity Monkey, and the Chaos Gorilla, it's even worse. <coughs> so, we talked about this uh, graph before. Um, so if you are not anti-fragile, how can you become more anti-fragile? For instance, if you are fragile or robust or you are resilient and you, you want to become anti-fragile, how do you do that? Um, well, that's actually the question. And the definition is that stable systems, because they don't change, eventually experience shocks large enough to cause catastrophic failure. So if you think you keep it as stable as possible, to prevent any harm, well, actually what you do is you make it fragile. So anti-fragile systems break a little all the time, just like the Chaos Monkey. You keep attacking it, you keep attacking it. And as a result, they will evolve and become less prone to catastrophic failure. So you want to uh, you attack your system with little small attacks, like the Chaos Monkey. <coughs> Well, what are the disorders in IT? Well, of course, those are the changes. Uh, you change existing functionality, or uh, implement new requirements, or support your uh, new business opportunities. They are all changes. So th those changes are actually the disorders. If you are in a fragile uh, environment, well, it might be quite difficult to handle those changes. Um, and 
you may be not able to uh, handle unexpected user inputs. And of course, you also may uh, see technical debt. Who is familiar with technical debt? Ah, ah, a lot of hands, a lot of hands. Um, we will come back to uh, that, that in a few slides. Uh, something robust in IT could again be Unix. Um, resilient in IT could be retry mechanisms and self-healing and auto-repair. That's resilient because you can get back to the level that you were. And anti-fragile in IT, that is for instance auto-scaling and microservices and continuous deployment and chaos engineering like the Cage Monkey and also open source. Um, but again, it's, it, in, in that case it's not just software, it's also actually a social technical system. So it's not only software but also the people, because that is what DevOps is about. Um, actually this is my fifth DevOps days, uh, the first one in, in Moscow of course. Um, but um, I see at a lot of DevOps days, I see actually a technical stream and a cultural stream, organizational stream, because the culture is also very important. Uh, uh, you need all the technique of course, but you also want to change that company, you want to change that organization. And it's very hard when you start in the very right uh, corner, uh, the lower right corner of an uh, organization. Um, we, talk, we talked about uh, asymmetry. Um, the asymmetry was uh, about uh, um, a graph uh, accelerating towards pain or gain. There's another asymmetry, uh, and that's called optionality. And that's also an important part of the book. Optionality. And an option, and uh, I think you all know options. You know, all know financial options, right? Financial options. But um, they cost money. But in real life, there are a lot of other options, and they are free or cheap, but you don't recognize them. And what you, uh, if you are in a situation that you are uh, anti-fragile and you are tinkering, that's when you're doing trial and error, you're tinkering and you are anti-fragile, you can just try and, and, uh, and try and try and try, and sometimes it may generate a little positive value, a little negative value, uh, but, and when you have an outlier, it will be positive, because you are anti-fragile. So it could be something like this. And one of the examples of that is, for instance, the Unicorn Club. And the Unicorn Club is the club of all those companies that are or that already reached a value of one billion dollars. They just tried and tried and tried, and all of a sudden they had a company that was growing up to one billion dollar in value. So startups are actually anti-fragile, and we already do that in uh, in uh, in IT. Uh, who knows the book The Phoenix Project? Ah, a lot of people. Uh, you, you should read it. A perfect book about uh, an organization getting towards uh, DevOps. And there are uh, uh, three ways, what I call it in, uh, in the book. Uh, the first way is about uh, flow, the second is about feedback, and the third is actually about continual exper experimentation and learning, the tinkering actually. So it's, it was already also in the book The Phoenix Project. If you are fragile, then it's quite dangerous to, to tinker, to do trial and error. If you are fragile, uh, you sometimes have a little bit positive, a little bit negative, but when you have an out outlier, it will be very heavy negative, because you are fragile. Um, and then you could enter what uh, the writer of the book calls, uh, calls the via negativa, um, and he says, the best way for a person or organization to become anti-fragile is to first decrease their downside. Things, people, actions, habits or systems that make you vulnerable to volatility and risk. And, and one of those things is actually uh, uh, technical debt. So what you actually want to do is uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, decrease the, the amount of negative impact that you have. So if you have a little bit of negative 
uh, negative impact, you make it smaller. And when you have that outlier, you also make it smaller. And um, if you go, if you transfer via Nictiva to IT, you actually say, okay, uh, like Spotify, who knows the movies on Spotify? Some, some people. Just look on YouTube, Spotify, marvelous uh, 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 videos about how to uh, transform an organization towards, uh, towards devil. And what Spotify says is get rid of handoffs, handoffs between teams, no handoffs. Uh, also get rid of politics, uh, get rid of fear and get rid of ego. That's the learnings of, um, of, uh, of Spotify. And I mentioned it before, technical debt. Technical debt is the, uh, what uh, Gene Kim, uh, the, the, uh, one of the writers of the book, The Phoenix Project, calls what you feel the next time you want to make a change. All those quick and dirty um, uh, changes that you made before. And this is actually uh, what technical debt uh, looks like. Um, blue. Uh, Blue uh, is actually uh, adding functionality to your uh, system and the yellow are defects. If you are only working on functionality, so actually on your product backlog and on your defect backlog, it will, after a few sprints, it will look like this. You will drown in defects because there are two other colors, the red one and the green one. The red one is technical depth. You also have to work on that. And you have the green one, and that's the improvement backlog. For instance, test automation, improving the way you work. So you have to actually to make a four color backlog. And if you do that, you will see that you manage down your defects. You get rid of technical debt. But you have to buy the bullet, of course, because if you add um, uh, if you add red and green to the left graph, well, there will be no blue uh, remaining. So you have to tell your customer that you will not deliver any, function, any new functionality in the next sprint. Now, the last concept, skin in the game, uh, that means a person has something to lose in a given situation. And that's also an important one, that uh, skin in the game is missing when you work in silos. But we don't do that anymore because we work DevOps, DevOps together. So we don't work with silos. And silos are actually fragilizers. What, that's something what, uh, what Talat also call, uh, calls in his book. Uh, uh, silos are fragilizers. Um, skin in the game is also missing in projects because in projects you are chasing date over benefit, chasing time over benefit, chasing cost over benefit, chasing features over benefit. So you can also say projects are fragilizers. You don't want projects because they are only think the project managers are only thinking about the project result, not about uh, what ops uh, should do with uh, the results. Uh, it's actually it, uh, it destroys knowledge, capability, and performance. So uh, just make DevOps teams instead of projects. Uh, because there is a direct relationship between the customer and the DevOps team, just execute the product backlog instead of staffing projects. And no resource shuffling, reliable velocity, and a clear cost of ownership because all those people in the DevOps team work for that particular business line. So, my last three slides. My advice for IT is uh, deploy small pieces of functionality to expose a system to a large number of small shocks. Well, we already know that, we do that, that's continuous delivery. Avoid technical debt um, and, and use the, uh, the graph that, uh, that I showed you with the four colors. It helped me a lot towards management and, and boards of directors to show that you have to work on technical debt to, uh, to, uh, to keep your speed. Keep some uh, fat on the meat, uh, and that means keep some redundancy. Uh, seek optionality, options like you saw before. Uh, you, could, you could be the next starter. Uh, keep things small, but network, not, no big projects. Um, and ensure that individuals that make decisions have skin in the game. Uh, ensure that they have something to lose. 
Advice to your business, um, these two books, Kill the Company and uh, Anticipate. Those two uh, books actually help your uh, company to become more anti-fragile. And kill, kill the company is actually really about killing your company. And then, <laughs> and, but then stepping, stepping inside the company again and, and, and then trying to seek out how to avoid that it should be killed. So, uh, killing the company is, uh, is a very uh, uh, yeah, powerful tool to help you think about anti-fragility. And my advice for you, uh, you could, could uh, look at gettingstronger.org uh, and there's a lot of information uh, about uh, how you could uh, uh, be stronger um, uh, regarding fitness, physiology, uh, psychology, uh, diets, uh, fitness and uh, a lot of uh, other uh, things. Uh, it's also the concept of hormesis that you will find on that particular uh, site. So it's an interesting site. Um, and also, what's also um, anti-fragile is spending time with other people and collaborate with them. It has a potentially large upside and almost no downside. For instance, a gathering, a meeting like today, the death of days. It's also actually anti-fragile. It's also optionality. And remember my last slide. Um, <laughs> most of the time, uh, the magic happens outside your comfort zone. Thank you. You have two great books that you told us about uh, for business. How, how to make businessmen really uh, read those books? How to make business? Yeah. Uh, I mean business people. How to, how to make them? Uh, yeah, well, that's actually one of the biggest problems because uh, that's also the reason that uh, one of the, actually the working group that I'm in is Enterprise DevOps. It's actually uh, about that particular problem. How do I make um, a company aware of the fact uh, that they should want DevOps, that they should uh, want to be anti-fragile, that they should uh, read books like that? Um, it, it's, it, and actually, the answer is, um, 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 getting to know the right people, uh, for instance, in the board of directors, just just make that contact, and it, it's most of the times it's easier than you think. Also, that those people you can uh, you can contact, you can have uh, a conversation with them and try to persuade them towards uh, anti-fragility, towards DevOps, etc. Uh, how to persuade your customer to spend the resources time to make your uh, project uh, anti-fragile? To make your project? Anti-fragile. How to persuade your customer to spend the time? Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think the best way is to, to prove it on a, on, a, on a small scale. To prove it that you're, that you're right. Um, and actually, um, Actually, what I, uh, what I already said is that when you work like a DevOps way of working, uh, you are already working at the um, So just prove it on a small scale. And then again, uh, related to the, to, to the answer I gave before, uh, meet the right people in your company. Meet the right people. Um, and make sure and, and, and try to explain them what you're what you're doing and 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 say well we both work for the same company we have the same goal that's also important in DevOps of course we have the same goal uh, you want you, you, you both want your your company to grow or to prosper um, so it, it, it's again about meeting the right people and, and, and it's again about options uh, trial and error actually trial and error. Uh, uh, meeting this one, meeting that one, but especially people higher in an organization. And what I said before, it is easier than you think. 